Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for bearing with the initial getting presentations on machines that starts. Uh, my name is Russell Newman. I want to warmly welcome all of you to this year's Union for Democratic Communications Conference on its 41st anniversary. Welcome to everyone here. My name is Russell Newman. I'm co-coordinator and treasurer of this year's conference with our colleague uh, Aaron Horesco, who I believe is uh, at a dizzying pace getting folks checked in out in the lobby. Uh, just a couple words before we begin with our panel this morning. UDC has always held a special place in my heart. It's a funny thing to say about a conference. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm not just an associate professor of digital media and culture at Emerson College. Uh, in Boston, but I'm also president of its full-time faculty union. You know, one perhaps, yeah, you know, you know, one perhaps among the strongest at a private college in the United States. We're in the midst of a negotiation, you know, as we speak. I am performing triple duty this week. Uh, the thing about being part of UDC, though, is that it's one of those places I know I can go where I'm not the only one doing such a thing, or doing the kind of academic work that inspired me to do, you know, to do this activism in the first place. I'm with hundreds of others here who are already doing this work from whom I can learn, uh, alongside others who are themselves aspiring to do this work. You know, this kind of energy is infectious in a way that you know, one doesn't find at a lot of other communications and sociology conferences uh, that we might frequent. You know, as Victor Picard succinctly noted uh, in the fantastic write-up that Annenberg produced about this conference, you know, he said, we're not just here to describe the world, we're here to change it. And more than one colleague and mentor of mine at UDC has said exactly this in the years I've been involved. You know, the point is to change it. You know, I take these words to heart, and I know that you're here because you have also taken those words to heart. You know, at this first session, we're going to be hearing a bit about UDC's own history and speak to its future trajectory a bit. And we're going to continue that discussion tomorrow with this year's winner of the Dallas Smythe Award, Sophia Noble, and we'll talk to some of the challenges that we're facing in our plenary this evening. You know, I'm of the firm belief that we still need an organization like the Union for Democratic Communications, you know, more than ever. You know, in the face of the start of new wars and the powerful lingering effects of old, UDC was always home to the dissidents who supported journalists but, rep that, but recognized uh, that our major media institutions were often uh, the most effective propagandists for war and plunder. Yeah. Our old critiques are ringing just as true this morning, and our task is to discover those critiques, the blind spots, and to fill them. Yeah. In the face of breathless talk about AI, growing misinformation channels, and even more questions, you know, urgent questions of surveillance and other emergent notions, you know, UDC reliably and refreshingly recognized that these boil down to questions not of technology, but of social and economic power. You know, but it goes even still further. In the face of corporate and otherwise uh, you know, forces whose modus operandi are the creation of division and despair in the pursuit of profit and power, you know, at its best, UDC stepped in with a counter drive for solidarity, action, hope, even renewal. You know, uh, not just in our activism, but in our analysis, which was always light years of what I found at some of the major conferences that I would attend. Uh, yeah. you know, a number of our field's brightest lights came out of UDC, in fact, more than a fair number of them from Penn. And looking out at the attendance of this very first panel, I'm seeing new flames alighting right now, with participants coming from as far as Nepal to join us for our conference this weekend, which is really amazing. So I want to take a moment just to thank the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania and the Media Inequality and Change Center for hosting, taking a chance on an in-person event when a lot of other institutions wouldn't. Uh, I'd also like to thank former Dean Michael Deli Carpini and present Dean Sarah Benet Weiser. I also want to thank Sarah Jackson, Victor Picard, and Todd Wolfson of the Mike Center for their involvement, leadership, and support throughout getting this conference off the ground. Uh, in particular, I'd also like to thank Briar Smith and Zachary Matthew, uh, who performed the lion's share of the, much of the lingu <laughs> linguistics logistics <laughs> you know, down here. <laughs> My old undergraduate career coming right back. You know, thank you too to the team of volunteers from Annenberg who are going to be working with us on tech uh, throughout the course of the days to come. So please do treat them kindly, and part of that is coming to your panels early enough to have your tech all set. It's a little bit clunky here, uh, and so uh, we're going to want to work out the kinks quickly. Um, 
I also want to recognize and thank my colleagues and our steering committee uh, with whom we've been working for the last two years to make this happen. My co-coordinator, Aaron Horesco, uh, Jeffrey Blevins, Christina Cecil, T.C. Corrigan, Rachel Golden, uh, Nolan Higdon, Andrew Kennis, Alicia Cosma, Steve Masek, Mitch Perkins, and Ron Terrell. You know, tomorrow at our business meeting, we'll be handling a number of important details that will help us to continue to grow uh, in both, as both an academic and activist organization. You know, we'll also be electing new officers and renewing our steering committee. And I hope that you'll consider running and joining uh, our steering committee for our next conference and whatever lies beyond. I mean, UDC is one of those conferences that's always been amongst the most grad student friendly. So I encourage you as a graduate student to get involved in the steering committee uh, going forward as well. And finally, I want to thank all of you for being here this year uh, as we rebuild, strengthen, and re-envision what an organization like UDC uh, can be and should be in the tumultuous times surely ahead. It's always been a place that left me inspired, and I hope this conference does the same for you. So with that, I'd like to introduce to the stage uh, Victor Picard, C. Edwin Baker Professor of Media Policy and Political Economy here at the University of Pennsylvania and someone who I'm really privileged to call an old friend as well. It's a privilege to introduce you. Thanks, Vic. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Russ, for that warm welcome, and good morning to all of you. It's so great to see so many old friends and also a lot of new faces, which is an excellent sign. Uh, as Russ mentioned, I co-direct the Media Inequality and Change Center, or the Mike Center, as we call it, with Sarah Jackson right here and Todd Wolfson. Uh, the Mike Center is a partnership between Rutgers and Penn. We research things like structural inequities in our media. We study how we can build non-commercial democratic communication systems and how activists can use media to shift narratives, build power, and fight for racial and economic justice. So very much in line with UDC, which we're so honored to host. I'd, add, I'd like to add just a few more thank yous to the great list that Russ generously offered earlier. In addition to our deans at Rutgers and Penn, I want to give heartfelt thanks to the awesome Annenberg staff and our incredible tech and facilities support. They've already saved us a couple times this morning, without whom we couldn't do any of this. Um, our entire mic team has been amazing, especially with Zach recently joining us, and I want to double down on thanking Briar Smith, our associate director. It's well known that Briar is the true force behind everything that we do at the Mike Center. I also want to thank Jack Bradich, who's UDC's uh, unofficial, or maybe we should make it official, uh, social chair. He's been uh, diligently studying uh, drinking and eating options for the evenings <laughs> here in Philly, and he and Mala put on a fantastic party last night at Making Worlds Bookstore, so thank you. I saw many of you there last night. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for being here. It's going to be a fun couple of days. We originally planned to host UDC in the spring of 2021. We even had a bunch of planning meetings in early 2020. We all know what happened to those plans. But part of the original hook for hosting UDC was its historical connections to Philly, which we're going to hear a lot more about momentarily. It seemed poetic to commemorate UDC's 40, at that time it would have been its 40th anniversary in Philadelphia where it was founded. It, it was also an added uh, nice touch to coordinate the conference with the Phillies uh, winning in the, in the playoffs last night, so you're welcome uh, for that. Um, so our opening plenary will reflect on UDC's history, but also its future, future struggles, future trajectories, obviously a very broad theme that can take us in many directions, especially given the many crises facing us at this very moment. Uh, but we'll start with some history with a video presentation from Janet Wasco. It took a community of critical scholars to found, to, to establish UDC, but more than any individual, Janet Wasco was absolutely key in its formation. In addition uh, to being a leading political economist, Janet was the president of IMCR for many years, and she continues to teach at the University of Oregon. And I, this is the moment of truth. Make sure we can get this going. So this is just a really little, a taste of the history of the, of the UDC. 
Uh, and hopefully it might uh, prompt some thoughts about where the UDC might be going and can go in the future. Uh, Should we kill the lights? I'm uh, going to start with some of the precedents that led up to the, the creation of, of the Perfect. UDC. And it wasn't just something that someone idly <laughs> thought about as they were walking along the beach. Uh, there were things going on that led to uh, um, uh, the creation of the organization. Uh, the first one I wanted to point to is at the University of Illinois. Uh, there was a group of us uh, studying uh, in the doctoral program and uh, really started thinking about talking about uh, the, the expansion, the growth of critical communications issues and uh, studies and uh, really wanted to try to bring uh, some people together and decided to do that through a newsletter. And uh, so a group of us, uh, uh, with our uh, uh, professor who we were studying with, Tom Guback, uh, uh, put together the Communication Perspectives newsletter. Uh, this was done on a typewriter, <laughs> on a Mimeo machine, and sent out by snail mail, as it's now called, uh, to an increasing number of people uh, in the US, Canada, and also eventually around the world uh, that were uh, uh, developing uh, approaches to studying uh, communications and media critically. Uh, so we were in the Midwest. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, uh, there was a group of uh, uh, doctoral students as well uh, who were studying at Stanford and uh, did a number of uh, what were called the West Coast Critical Communication Conferences. Uh, I'm including some names there. These, these, I believe there were around five of them. Uh, and it was around the same time as, as in Illinois we were uh, 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 doing communication perspectives. But also at the same time there were, were, were people who were really expanding and working more and more in the area of independent alternative media. Uh, uh, critical ways to be thinking about and developing uh, computer communication, telecommunications. A few of them are, are uh, uh, pictured here. Top left is Karen Possell, who worked uh, with computers at the time. They were just, you know, just really taking off. Uh, Bob Jacobson did some work, uh, 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 legislative work, actually, uh, dealing with telecommunications. Uh, and, and critical ways of thinking about the, how they were evolving. And then, of course, Dee Dee Halleck, who I understand is going to be there at the conference, um, and her paper, Tiger Television, uh, was only one of various projects uh, uh, growing in independent and alternative media. All of, uh, of these three people became active in, in UDC, but uh, first of all, another event uh, around this time was happening at Temple University in Philadelphia, uh, organized by Sari Thomas, called a Conference on Communication and Culture. This was 1981. After that conference, a number of us, I would say maybe ooh, something like 50 or so, uh, gathered um, and uh, to discuss the growth of critical communication and media research and activism. And what might we be doing uh, in terms of, uh, you know, expanding, promoting, developing uh, those ideas? Um, this discussion, as I've noted here, involved various possibilities of what should we do. One idea was to become more active or visible in some of the already existing organizations, such as International Communication Association and so forth. Or... Uh, should we form a new uh, organization, a new association? And the, a lot of discussion took place and finally the majority of the attendees voted to create a new organization and thus I would say it was the first step really in the formation of, of, of the UDC. Uh, this was 1981. In 1982, uh, the first conference was also held in Philadelphia. This was November 82. Uh, it was actually held at uh, the International House, which uh, is located, was located uh, 
on Annenberg's campus, and it was an extremely exciting event. We actually had George Gerbner open the event uh, in, in, in a way that really was very supportive and strong. Uh, it was uh, extremely exciting and led to uh, a kind of formal creation of UDC, including uh, a statement that was approved by the members that I believe still is in, in effect for the UDC, <laughs> highlighting some of uh, the components of uh, this new organization, which would include <clears throat> researchers, journalists, media producers, poly anal policy analysts, academics, and activists. So not just research, not just academics. Uh, it really was an attempt to bring a lot of people together uh, to uh, uh, further the critical study of communications uh, and those those uh, uh, goals that are listed there, uh, specifically also to encourage <clears throat> and foster alternative oppositional independent uh, production of media uh, and also to uh, somehow help develop democratic communication systems locally, regionally, and internationally, even though we were uh, mostly uh, uh, U.S. And, and Canada. Um, we still ha had noted, of course, a lot of activities going on in the rest of the world. Uh, the UDC also um, uh, very uh, importantly uh, encourages, uh, and at that time, wanted to encourage critical perspectives and in theory production and the study of not just popular culture that's specified here, but I think a wide range of uh, issues related to media and communication and specified was through conferences, newsletter letter, and other activities, uh, the goal was to bring together people, media producers, researchers, policymakers, activists, and so forth, um, to promote various kinds of critical approaches. Uh, so the other point was also to work with other progressive organizations uh, to facilitate uh, democratic communication. I think some of the early years of the UDC, we tried to do uh, and did uh, many of these things. Uh, and I'm absolutely uh, so pleased that UDC continues and uh, doing some of these uh, very, very important uh, uh, activities. Uh, we went on, uh, pardon my very, very fuzzy, weak images for some of these. They're, uh, they're dated. <laughs> um, we went on to have uh, conferences every year. Second one was in Washington. Uh, we met also in uh, other other locations, New York, uh, uh, Ottawa, and so forth. I'm not listing them all here. These are just the posters I could find. Um, the conferences became extremely important, as they often are for organizations, for people to come together to meet, to do work, share their work, and so forth. Uh, we also uh, immediately started a newsletter. <laughs> the first version was something exciting called News and Notes. <laughs> uh, we did a few issues based on that name, of course, but then we changed the name to the Democratic Communique. Um, which still was a kind of newsletter, not the kind of um, um, uh, journal that it is that it is now. Uh, but the newsletter, Democratic Communique, included a lot of different uh, um, uh, features, uh, various kinds of activities uh, were announced. Uh, the conferences, of course, were announced, including, for instance, this one on the right. Uh, 1993, the UDC met in Cuba, and yes, Gabriel Garcia Marquez was the keynote. Um, and so, of course, the, the, the newsletter spread the word about the conferences, also reviewed books, but not just books, uh, also media, uh, films, videos, media about media, uh, announced and also reviewed. Uh, other kinds of news uh, of uh, the organization, but also announcements and links to other organizations uh, was part of, of, of the newsletter. 
Uh, and then also um, news of what were called regional and local chapters. And we actually had uh, quite a few local chapters and a couple of regional ones, some more active than others, and um, uh, some uh, were uh, quite active in organizing events uh, and activities, others uh, uh, less so, but certainly it represented uh, uh, not just the national, but the local and regional. We also uh, did other activities, one in particular around this time in 84, uh, we, the organization edited a, 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 an issue of the journal Media, Culture and Society called Critical Communication Research in North America. And this of course was a, a bit more academic, although there were articles that went beyond just academic discussions uh, in this one volume. Uh, uh, we also had merchandise, <laughs> probably a t-shirt for every conference. Uh, uh, this one uh, was dug out by Eileen Meehan and Al Babbitt uh, when I told them that I was doing this presentation and uh, I want to thank them for, for giving me the photo. Um, also, we participated quite a bit with IEMCR members, many of us were IEMCR members, and also uh, uh, met at those organizations. Uh, these days, uh, at the time, there wasn't a political economy section. Today there is, and uh, a lot of sympathetic people uh, involved in that uh, aspect of IAMCR. Uh, there were marches and demonstrations and so forth. This is just one example, a little blurry again, sorry. Uh, and we have in the front row here, Vinnie Mosco and his nephew on a, 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 a March for Peace uh, as an example. And then also I wanted to just give a shout out to those, uh, uh, those people who really inspired us, maybe not working directly all the time with the organization in, this, in, in, in the organizing, but certainly sim uh, uh, sympathetic, worked with us, uh, in various ways, um, yes, these are all men, just happens to be. Uh, and then I just wanted to share some of the people who also worked with us, again, all men, um, from, uh, from Europe, uh, sometimes attending our conferences and participating in various ways. Um, some of the key organizers here, and I'll, I'll, I'll list the names going around from the top here is Vinnie Mosco, Jennifer Slack, Eileen Meehan, Tom Guback, Oscar Gandy, Karen Paulsell, Fred Fegis, and Tim Haight. Uh, these folks, uh, most of them were key um, to the organizing the core uh, of, of, um, of the organization. Uh, we met, uh, we had the opportunity to connect with people at our conferences in various ways. As you know, this is very a really important part of um, building a community. Uh, we also, of course, met at the conferences, presented our work, got excited, um, and uh, there's there's just numerous um, uh, things to say about that process of sharing work, um, and uh, I think that that was certainly just the beginning in a way, but it goes on and it goes on with people coming together. And I'm extremely happy that the UDC is still coming together, and I wish I were there in Philadelphia. Uh, with you, but uh, look forward to seeing you in the future, and we'll look forward to also hearing uh, about the conference itself. Thank you very much. Awesome. Right. <clears throat> that was such excellent history, and I should have mentioned that Janet really, really wanted to be here. She couldn't make it today, but I'm so glad she was able to share this presentation with us. And I should also uh, mention that Jana has volunteered to give us, uh, to donate all of her historical materials so that we can create an archival collection here at Annenberg. I'm gonna talk about this more during the business meeting tomorrow, but 
Um, so this history will continue to grow. I'll be asking people to look under their, especially the, old, the members who've been with us for a while, uh, look, un, <laughs> look, sorry, look, uh, look in the, at your attic or under your bed or wherever you might have boxes of materials and uh, please share those uh, with us. Um, so as the panelists can now uh, come up to the front, I'm gonna talk just a couple, uh, you can slowly make your way. I'm gonna talk a little bit more. Um, <laughs> um, so I will, uh, I just wanna say a couple more things about the, um, about the history of UDC, and I've been talking to a lot of the earlier members who have been sharing their stories with me, people like Oscar Gandhi, Vinnie Mosco, uh, Manju Pendiker, Eileen Meehan, Dan Schiller. It seems clear to me that not only was UDC founded in response to and within these ascendant social movements at the time, but on an interpersonal level, a major aim was to support critical scholars, many of whom felt somewhat isolated in their respective institutions. And UDC provide a forum for critical scholars to find each other. I have a great quote from Tom Gubak, who Janet mentioned. He was a UDC founder and mentor to many political economists. And in describing UDC's original purpose, he wrote via email, quote, Many left-wing scholars and students, and that's what we were and are, lefties, progressives, critical researchers, felt there was a need for an organization we could call our own, where we could feel comfortable talking about issues and ideas with the vocabulary and assumptions that we more or less share. We needed common ground, mutual support, and encouragement, though not necessarily total agreement. We also needed to demonstrate that our point of view and assumptions were prolific and sound and that they could support an organization. To say this another way, other national organizations didn't always provide an inclusive atmosphere or for our scholarship. And I think that's an ongoing question about the importance of UDC and you heard from Janet there was an early decision made whether they should create a new division within ICA or to create an organization on the outside. Um, so. Much to, to talk about, I think this resonates with some of the issues facing us today and UD's history can help us chart a path forward. And to help us think through these questions and challenges, we've assembled a group of leading activist scholars. I'm going to quickly introduce them in the order they, they will be speaking. Uh, first up, we'll have Chenjrai Kumanyika, who's a professor at NYU's Carter Journalism Institute. In addition to publishing widely in both academic and popular venues, Chenjirai specializes in using narrative nonfiction audio journalism. Among many other projects, I know we're familiar with many of them, he was the co-executive producer and co-host of Gimlet Media's podcast, Uncivil, for which he received a Peabody Award. The next speaker will be Didi Halleck, who is the founder of Paper Tiger Television and co-founder of Deep Dish Television. She's Professor Emerita in the Department of Communication at the University of California, San Diego, and the author of the classic book, Handheld Visions, The Uses of Community Media. Deepa Kumar is an award-winning scholar, activist, and public intellectual. She's a professor of journalism and media studies at Rutgers and is the author of innumerable articles and two excellent books, Outside the Box and Islam Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire. And finally, we have Paul Chakravarti, who's the James Weldon Johnson professor at NYU's Gallatin School and uh, my old department, the, part the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication. She's published widely in numerous academic journals and is the author or editor of several important books, including Global Communications Towards a Transcultural Political Economy, a book I use often in my classes. It's co-edited with Yuzi Zhao. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I, I have asked each speaker to speak uh, seven to, to ten, hopefully no more than ten, minutes. Um, uh, if there's time, uh, we'll, have, um, we'll have questions. Um, I know, so we're going to have Chenjirai going up first. He's going to have to leave the panel a little bit early. Um, and then Didi will have some slides. I did notice she has 66 slides, but <laughs> she, she assured me that, what did you say? It's like TikTok. You're just going to flip, flip through them. So uh, at, at the two minute mark, I'm going to be waving my, my flags. So Chenjirai, please take it away. Hmm. 
Thank you, uh, Victor, and thank you to everyone who has worked to make sure that this conference happens, that we, that we have this time also to reflect on where UDC has been and where it's going. Um, I, you know, I just want to start out by saying that uh, I've been, you know, UDC has pr really profoundly shaped everything that I do as a scholar and as and in my work in activism. I've been attending the conference since 2009. So that would have been roughly, I think, 30 years after the, the first pre-UDC uh, meeting um, in, in Illinois. And I just want to talk a little bit about how it, how it has shaped me um, and in the brief time that I have, because I think that there are some lessons in there for what is valuable about UDC and a few things that can point forward. Um, I also just want to say I'm really thankful to Janet for what she offered. You know, as we think about going forward and what new capacities or what capacities uh, UDC might need to develop, it's, it's, I'm like, wow, there's so many things to draw on in terms of what has already been done, some of which I wasn't aware of. Uh, I came, you know, I, I did my doctoral work in Penn State's um, College of Communication, and we had a solid tradition of political economy in that, in that school. Um, you know, we had, you know, I had tremendous um, instructors and, and mentors. Matt McAllister is, is here with us. Also, Ron Bedick. Um, many, of, many of my colleagues had a class, the, the pleasure of studying with Ron and Jeannie Hall. And so they're real heavy on my heart today as I think about uh, UDC. And so we did have that tradition in our school, but it's also true that in that college, you know, we have a really big media effects program, you know what I'm saying? And so there, and it, <laughs> it was a sense like it, in our school, although we felt like we were really learning interesting stuff, there was like, it's clear like, okay, none of us is about to get like a million dollar grant <laughs> and really be the star of the show. Um, likewise, when we would go to some of the professional conferences, I mean, I, you know, conferences like ICA and NCA um, have been absolutely crucial in, in my development and now I think have really exciting divisions, activism and social justice, feminist divisions and so forth. But also those are massive conferences where you just can easily get lost and also where what is described as critical research was a little bit different than what we were learning, you know. Um, and this is not, I, I wanna tread carefully here. I don't wanna, I don't wanna like, you know, I don't wanna throw shade on anybody's textual analysis. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, but I, I will say that, so, so coming to UDC was like, wow. I mean, one thing I can consistently say about the UDC conference was the level of critical scholarship. I mean, the ways that we were pushed to think about multiple layers of things, to think about the different ways that these phenomena were determined, with critical, with political economy at the center, with critical realism at the center. Um, you know, I mean, it was like, I just consistently, you know, I'm a hip hop artist, and hip, as a hip hop artist, sometimes you're always trying to listen to see who really got the bars. You know, that's what we say when we talk about the lyrics. And I felt like UDC is the conference where people had the bars. I'm like, you know, just very substantive research. We also got to encounter this, the, many of the people in this room that we have been reading. You know, people like, um, you know, Deepa and Paula got to meet, like Eileen Meehan and Robin Anderson. And, and you know, often when people are talking about encountering your, these scholars, we kind of talk about it and it's like, they became human. You know, they were like human people and they were cool. I mean, first of all, I've abandoned the need for people who are influential to me to be cool and nice. Like, you don't, you actually don't have to. Um, <laughs> but it is true, they were really fun folks. I just gotta say that. Fun, supportive folks. But more importantly, we were able to encounter these people, not just as scholars on a page, but as people who were political actors in their departments, in political actors in movements, in media making, strategizing and understanding, new ways to understand the academy as a site of political struggle itself. And that was really important because, you know, there was a sort of tradition where a lot of folks um, were kind of like, well, what I do for activism is just what I do in my classroom. You know, that was a tradition that we were being invited into. And UDC was a place where it was like, you were, you were just getting exposed to a rich spectrum of people, who different kinds of activist research that was really important. So I just wanted to um, say that that was really important. And so it, it influenced, deeply influenced my scholarship. Um, I was interested in hip hop. And you know, it's funny, I, I encourage everyone to read 
the tremendous review of UDC history that Ron and Aaron Horesco produced in 2013, but also the interview with Vincent Mosco and James Tracy, because Vincent Mosco talks about how he was stunned to learn that, you know, how Keith Richards and, and the Rolling Stones were stunned to learn that some of the money they had raised went to fund um, radar technology in Vietnam. You know, and I think that that's an interesting, and he was, you know, and, my, and, my, and Vince, Vincent Mosco was saying he probably shouldn't have been surprised. But that was an example of the way you might be pushed to talk about hip hop as opposed to like, I'm just going to look at the lyrics, right? How is this actually embedded in these practices of empire? Or how is the militant R of hip hop being used to sort of black or hip hop wash, you know, a new ne neoliberal regime? Those kinds of questions, right? Were the types of things that UDC pushed me um, to try to study more deeply. Um, and so I just want to say uh, a couple of other things on that note. Um, as it, you know, one, you know, I guess I'll, I'll say these two things. One is, it takes a lot of work to make UDC go. This is obvious. We've, we've thanked these people. And here, I want to sort of shout out some of my colleagues, um, all the people who have kept this, this conference alive. I mean, one thing that you see in these accounts is that it's a struggle to find a new place to host UDC. It's a struggle that it takes to make this conference function. And that service, I mean, I, I got to shout out my man Aaron Horesco, TC, Michelle, um, all the people who have um, just, and you know, Briar in this context, I mean, it just really does take work. And I, I think I don't have to go without saying, but we do, I owe UDC some serious service, and I hope that everybody in this room feels the same way. I also want to say that there are some limitations I've seen with this conference. There are moments in the conference where at times it felt a little bit like, the slides that you saw um, in certain ways. And I was in panels where, with some of my colleagues, where they invited um, UDC to think a little bit more interdisciplinary way, to think about what does it mean to think about critical political economy um, outside of like Western traditions or less Western traditions. You know, and if you go to a certain other conference communities, you know, you really realize like, oh, wow, there, there is a little bit of a, sometimes a, a slightly narrow focus, at least in the era of UDC that I encountered at different moments. I want to be really precise about this critique. But I'm saying that the fact that I was able to witness those critiques and that the conference itself was a stage for us to think about those debates is important. And I would say that at a time when, you know, I think a lot of people don't really understand, I mean, I think, you know, the, the function of higher education is, in, is really in serious doubt. Um, all kinds of ways that different scholars are under attack. The freedom of speech is being, is being chilled, and we have to think about how to relate to a broader public. I think that you know, some of the moves in the labor movement, they've begun to think about this idea of you know, labor organizing for the common good, right? At Rutgers, we've seen, and, and, I, and, I, and by the way, who is it, how many scholars in here, like you're about to go on strike or on strike in your university? A couple of people in the room? All right. <laughs> so I mean, I just would say, At the very minimum, thinking as we go forward, UDC needs to develop the capacity to support that. Um, but I also want to say that thinking about what it means to have a UDC for the common good. Because as much as UDC has been strong and we don't want organizations to take on capacities that they can't do, that's a recipe for failure for the left. You try to do everything. But I do think that um, we, you know, that part, you know, I was looking in Janet's slide and I saw, oh wow, there's a UDC New York grassroots events, right, events that are specifically focused on moments of organizing. That's the kind of tradition I think we need to try to think about and reclaim in certain ways. But um, ultimately, I'm just going to stop there and say that, you know, coming in as a, as a, as a person who came into this as a student, it's, this has been a community that's deeply important to me. It's shaped me in all the ways I outline. Um, it's been a place that there really is like no other place, even with all the divisions and other, and other um, conferences. And uh, it shaped my scholarship. And I, 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 I hope that we can uh, figure out a way to keep it going. And I look forward to what my colleagues have to say about the future directions. I think I have to go up here um, and hopefully turn this on. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm going to help or. <laughs> but I will try to find slides here. Right, that's yeah, it, right? right? 
and I think we want to do this, right? Okay. Now, how do I go forward? Uh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, this is very weird. The, this is the School of Communication, and they could not interface with Mac, but that's, <laughs> that's all right. Okay, um, I just wanted to begin just to show how I got into this a bit, in that um, it really was, uh, I, 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 I love your statement about, uh, about the, uh, the limitations of academia somehow. And I was at Antioch and I quit. I, I only went two years. I didn't want to get involved with, with uh, academia at all. And so um, I, uh, I, I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to do um, film and hopefully I can move this down. And so I, I, this is a film I made in uh, 1961, which uh, was uh, children make movies, and uh, but I was interested in painting on film, and I tried it out with the kids. And there's a, there's an exhibit right now at the Whitney Museum with about the work of Harry Smith, who was an incredible, wonderful scholar, and who uh, painted on film. It, and did a lot of experiments with animation. And so one of my things was to get to do animation. And I thought, I really love the drawings and the work of Peter Schumann and the Bread and Puppet Theater. And I thought, well, Peter Schumann could do an animation film. And so that's what I started doing. But then Peter Schumann, I don't know if anybody has ever worked with Peter. I, I, I don't have time for that. I have to do to get this big puppet done. So um, he had promised us he'd work with us, but then I was working with George Griffin, who's an amazing, wonderful animator. And so uh, we, we, we just shot the this, this, this circus, and, uh, and, and I thought we'd still work on the animation. He said, just put that all together. So I did, it's a film called Meadows Green, and the theater took it on tour with them. And as they were on tour, they would, they went, they would take it to the TV station, and they would play it. And the, it was on a TV in, in France, in Germany, in uh, Greece, and it, and it was on all these public television stations in Europe. So when I came back, I took the film to the local WNET television and said, could you play this film? And they said, oh no, we can't play that. It doesn't have, have an, in, no one introduces it. And it's not enough information or whatever. No, it would play. So I, that really got me involved in looking at public television. So, so I made this flyer, <laughs> and we had a demonstration, and uh, we made, this is in 73, uh, oh no, 78. By 75, I had three kids, so I was also raising children and uh, goats. I had a goat farm. <laughs> but, uh, but that note that the activism that we started there was taken up uh, internationally. So this was a thing in the London Daily, Daily Telegraph, and it actually influenced the um, the formation of Channel Four, which was also a, a a kind of protest against the BBC. And I met all these terrific people: Peggy Charon, Nolan Bowie, Wil Wilhelmina Cook. Uh, and and uh, this amazing woman, Emma Bowen. Has, how many people have ever heard of Emma Bowen? She is an amazing woman. Only Mark. It's like it's like she. We should know her. She's a hero. She's our saint. 
the, and uh, so we f formed this coalition to make public television public, and we were even written up in, uh, in TV Guide in 78. Uh, there was a whole question about how do you restructure te public television, but in, uh, when I started thinking about it, how, who writes about this, how can I learn about this, and then I discovered Horkheimer, Adorno, uh, Herb Schiller, uh, many, many other scholars, Janet Wasco, Tom Guback. I read his stuff very early on. And wait a minute, there's something wrong with our public television system. So I'm just going to quickly go through these. Uh, but we did win. We went to Congress. We did, we, we uh, actually learned a lot about lobbying and the fact that uh, the NRA has this huge building in Washington just for lobbying and we were independent producers. We didn't have anything in DC. Uh, there was a wonderful group in, in Pittsburgh that also got involved. And at the same time, there were movements about the problems of of, of the kind of stereotypes that were on television. And so Paper Tiger grew out of trying to make a film about the media that would actually critique the media. And to get, to get our program out there, we demonstrated to get public access in New York. And here's Paper Tiger. We would send out these little schedules, Paper Tiger Television. Uh, we had a big march for immediate, how many people were, was anybody here at this demonstration? It was incredible. This was at the Media and Democracy Congress. And we, we rented a bus and went around to all the moguls. Uh, and then of course we demonstrated at the NAB for, for um, this was actually in, uh, an amazing demonstration, and here's Stephen Dunifer from the Bay Area, amazing uh, pirate, radio pirate, and we worked a lot with with uh, petri dish uh, and the whole uh, Prometheus radio. This is building. Uh, radio stations, and I visited this station, an amazing, beautiful radio station in in Florida. That, if you're ever down in the Everglades, you should go visit. They're incredible, and people, the workers, are on the station and listening to it in the fields as they work. And I love that um, Petrie and the Prometheus people always. <laughs> taught people the basic skills of putting together a uh, circuit board. And here's, we were connected with other radio activists around the world, Mexican. And this is some stuff to try. How do you get out? Well, Paper Tiger originally started to do something to promote Paper Tiger. Uh, but then realized that there was other material around that people were making. So we set up this whole network and we've done, we did programs about the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War. And, and that eventually really led to Democracy Now! How many people here listen to Democracy Now! There would be no Democracy Now! without Deep Dish TV. It was a radio station. And it was on radio, it was a radio program, and it was on five different radio stations. And with using the Deep Dish Network, which had already been built up of 200 stations around the country, we were able to really promote it and make sure that it, does, uh, it would get out there. Uh, just a look, quick look at other possibilities, this was an amazing, um, a gr group of labor activists who did um, exchange th through bicycling tapes around UpNet, LaborLink TV, uh, and there was also computer and net activism. 
how many, does anybody remember Reset? It was, it was this amazing little uh, uh, newspaper. Um, and pr of course, Process World, which was also a kind of uh, computer activist newsletter. <laughs> and of course, Indie Media, here we go. We had our 20th anniversary la la last two years, four years ago. Um, and connecting up with media activists around the world, with indie media. And, but it, this all ties into a thing that <laughs> was very important to me in 1981, and that really grew out of meet the, the first meeting of UDC, which was to have people actually make a reaction to the vicious attack on the so-called New World Information Order and the, and the McBride Report, which was Many Voices, One World, which is, if you, have, if you don't have a copy of this, Andrew Calabrese did re, help to reprint it. It's, an, it's really a wonderful book that the U.S. totally, uh, Deep sixed it. It, 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 it. They actually bought up copies and destroyed them. Um, it's a very important book for us all to understand. Uh, there's the Union for Democratic Communication. And similar, I've been involved with the Non Commercial Users Constituency, which is, if you look at the big picture about the internet, what is the main organization? that is involved in terms of the regulation of the internet, and that is um, the, the ICANN, which I have to get here. And we actually had a kind of alternative to WISIS, the world, uh, s s what was it? <laughs> summit, <laughs> summit, right. The World Summit on the Embrace. But we actually say, staged a kind of coup in, um, in Geneva and, and actually projected. This is the, uh, w w the WIPO building in Geneva. And we projected a film by Negative Land called Gimme the Mermaid. So. <laughs> But all of this stuff comes from my, um, my archive, and um, I'm, uh, I hope to get some of the material to, about the UDC to the wonderful archive that Victor has proposed here. So, but that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Dee Dee. And first of all, kudos to Janet, Eileen, Vinnie, and all the others who built the UDC in the 1980s, a period of backlash, as you just mentioned, a period of Ronald Reagan, attacks on labor, of rising neoliberalism, and the general rightward shift in US society. Without their pioneering radical scholarship in difficult times, I can honestly say that many of us would not be here. That is to say, we would not have been able to do the kind of dissertations we want to do, much less secure tenure and job stability. So it's very important to have networks like this and people who offer support when needed for radical scholarship. Uh, thank you, Victor, for inviting me to be on this panel, and huge thanks to the UDC Steering Committee, the Mike Center, and all the organizers involved in putting this uh, together. Just want to give a shout out to the janitorial staff who are not here right now, but who will be picking up after us. I hope we can be considerate and not leave our cups and other things lying around. Um, so Victor sent us a series of questions to respond to. And <laughs> if this conference was happening last Thursday, my comments would have been very different. I was originally going to take up uh, briefly two arguments that I've made at the UDC in the past. 
The first was organizing at the point of production, building on an argument that I made as part of my Dallas Smythe lecture, which I believe was published in Democratic Communique. But Chenjirai has already talked about academic labor, and I believe there's a panel on it, so I won't say uh, very much more about it. I was also briefly going to uh, talk about an argument that I made at the closing plenary of the UDC in Toronto. I was in Toronto for two conferences, the UDC as well as the Critical Race and Ethnicity Conference, and the contrast could not have been more stark. While at one, there was fantastic and rich discussion of race, ethnicity, uh, and so on, uh, but a complete absence of political economy and capitalism and racial capitalism. At the other, there was almost no discussion of issues of race, much less gender, and so forth. And I see that that too has changed, and we have panels that address race, gender, and other intersectional issues. What I was going to talk about is the Stop Cop City movement, which I think is one of the most important movements in the US right now, bringing together questions of environmental justice, something that I don't know if we as a UDC have engaged with enough. Uh, along with the struggle to stop the mil militarization uh, of the police. I've been studying this for the last couple of months, and I have a paper on media coverage, particularly of the terrorism-related uh, arrests that have taken place. 50 people, 50 activists have been uh, arrested on the grounds of being domestic terrorists, which is really the expansion and the afterlife and the legacy of the war on terror in this uh, kind of uh, securitization. At any rate, that paper will be published next month by the Cost of War Project at Brown University, and perhaps we can talk about this uh, in the discussion section. What I'd like to focus in the time that I have is two questions that Victor asked us to address, whether the UDC should internationalize and what struggles, challenges, and questions it should engage with more. Specifically, I want to offer some comments on Palestine and the Palestinian struggle, which have taken on heightened importance considering what has happened over the last week. As many of you know, this past Saturday, Hamas surprised the Israeli readership with a large-scale attack on Israeli towns bordering Gaza. The attack killed at least 1,200 Israelis. Many of the dead were civilians, including elderly and children. This is obviously a war crime. This is a fact, and it is important to acknowledge this fact and the human suffering that it has produced. But that is not the end of the conversation. Rather, it is just the beginning. And it is incumbent on us to seek to understand both the causes of this tragic event and how best to respond to it. So the Israeli newspaper Haaretz offered the following an analysis in its uh, October 8th editorial. Quote, the disaster that befell Israel on the holiday of Simchat Torah is, is the clear responsibility of one person, Benjamin Netanyahu. The prime minister who has prided himself on his vast political experience and irreplaceable wisdom in security matters completely failed to identify the dangers he was consciously leading Israel into when establishing a government of annexation and dispossession. When appointing Smortrick and Ben Gavir to key positions while embracing a foreign policy that openly ignored the existence and rights of Palestinians, end quote. I agree with this, but I think we should go beyond this and go beyond one man and his government. As one commentator put it, Palestinians and their allies have long been sounding the alarm that Israel was subjecting Palestinians to a brutally violent apartheid system against Palestinians with impunity, and that there would be terrible consequences if the international community failed to intervene. Over and over, we've been warned about the cat uh, ca cataclysmic violence that would be inevitable if Israel was not held to account. As Palestinian historian Rashid Khalidi put it recently, quote, an entire people has been living under this kind of incredible oppression in a pressure cooker. It had to explode, unquote. Now, obviously, I cannot go through a uh, thorough analysis of the Israel-Palestinian conflict in this very brief uh, presentation, but I do want to make a few quick points. I think it's important to emphasize that the attack was above all a product of this pressure cooker, including a 16-year blockade and devastating military attacks that have killed thousands and left, more than Gaza, left most of Gaza's 2.3 million people destitute. 
Half of Gaza's population consists of children who have been subjected to relentless bombings their entire lives. Meanwhile, just this year, in attacks on the West Bank towns of Jenin and Nablus and others, Palestinian uh, civilians have faced escalating violence from Israeli settlers and the Israeli Defense Forces, including the killing of 248 civilians, 40 children among them. And the bellicose rhetoric coming from Israel's right-wing government is really only a part of these developments. And so people know that uh, Smotrich has basically called for the entire Palestinian town of Huara to be wiped out, right? Um, so it must be stressed that efforts also at nonviolent resistance to Israeli apartheid and the inhumane conditions of Gaza have been blocked at every turn. When in 2018, Gazans conducted nonviolent demonstrations known as the Great March of Return along the border, 214 Palestinians, including 46 children, were killed, and over 36,000, including nearly 8,800 children, were injured by the Israeli military. Moreover, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, a strategy inspired by the successful anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, has been criminalized and denounced as anti-Semitic throughout the West, including at the local, state, and federal levels in the United States. When peaceful methods of resistance are effectively crushed, it is predictable that this would be the outcome. So what can we do? First, I think we can use the amazing videos that the media education foundations have produced on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, in, not just in our courses, but also in teachings. Satjali has produced some fantastic videos, uh, most recently the occupation of the American mind. Second, we need to defend scholars who have come under attack, such as Zarina Graywall at uh, Yale University. I'm sure there are others, people can bring that up. Third, we need to pressure our administrations to defend the right of pro-Palestinian students and faculty to express their solidarity with Palestinians without being harassed and treated as security threats. Um, Evelyn El Sultani has a new book, and uh, one of the chapters is about how pro-Palestinian students face not just emotional threats, but physical threats to their safety. And administrations basically turn the other way and don't do anything to keep them safe. I want to end by highlighting the UDC's long opposition to imperialism. The events of last Saturday, much like 9-11, has created an atmosphere in which media support for US and Israeli policies has intensified to even more dangerous levels. It is an atmosphere in which dissent is being repressed and, the, and where the threat of job loss is forcing those without job security to stay silent. Now more than ever, we have an obligation as anti-imperialist scholars, not simply to speak out, but to provide sophisticated and historically grounded analyses and make them available in all sources of independent and alternative media. Now more than ever, we need to build and support independent media, a struggle, of course, that many in the UDC have long been involved with. I'll end by reflecting on the conference theme, Left Undone. I believe the subject of Palestine is indeed one that has not been given sufficient atten uh, attention in the UDC and in that sense has been left undone. I hope that we can take this up more in the years to come. At the same time, I'm assuming that this is also a pun left undone. Um, and I just want to you know, say that this moment is one where the left can indeed be undone in the way that the left came under attack after the events of 9-11. Certainly there have been thoughtless and heartless comments made by some which have been used to discredit the left overall. And so I want to caution us and say that what we put forward should be sophisticated. Otherwise, we risk undoing the left even while we stand up and take a principled anti-imperialist stance. So that's it. Thank you very much. Not a hard act to follow at all. Um, <laughs> so uh, I would also like to thank Victor and everyone else, um, faculty and staff, 
uh, for the invitation um, and the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I think there's a bit of an echo here. I'm, I'm going to pick up on a lot of themes that have been covered um, uh, by the other panelists. Um, but I would like to begin um, with a land acknowledgement. Um, I do want to um, acknowledge the fact that uh, UPenn and our UDC meeting here in Philadelphia is taking place on the occupied um, ancestral homelands of the Lenape people. Um, and I, I believe this is important to acknowledge because even as we work, um, as Deepa's um, uh, beautiful presentation uh, made, made um, very clear, even as we work to increase the awareness of historical and ongoing colonial and racial violence, indigenous exclusion and erasure, we acknowledge, we have to acknowledge the effect of that legacy in educational institutions um, like our universities and our academic conferences. So it's, it's important to connect the dots between um, the kinds of violence um, that, um, you know, it, it, that people in Gaza are about to face and facing already, uh, genocidal violence um, potentially backed with U.S. Um, military and, and the U.S. media that is beating the war drums um, as loudly as they were with the invasion of Iraq. That is the moment we're in right now. Um, so uh, picking up on what Deepa um, said, and I'm sure many of us are thinking about, um, we also need to think about the connection between Gaza and uh, the racial colonial violence in the context where we, where we live. So um, Victor posed a number of uh, questions, challenging questions, um, and gave us 10 minutes to answer them. <laughs> so um, I, um, um, I, let me just start by saying first, I am, I'm very happy to be here at, at, at UDC and um, see so many um, faces who, um, and, and see people that I haven't seen in a long time. This panel itself for me um, is, is really um, meaningful. Uh, Didi Halleck, who of course is an inspiration to all of us as an activist scholar, um, was the one of the people, may, I think of her as the main person who hired me in my first job out of graduate school at UC San Diego. Uh, Chenjirai is a, a new colleague at, at NYU and Deepa and I of course have known each other for um, for a long time, we're old, and so um, <laughs> so it's 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 wonderful. As we all know, for those of us who work at universities, our colleagues are not always our friends, and and more importantly, our colleagues are not always our comrades. And so it is um, it is lovely to have that community um, um, here this morning. So the questions that um, I'd like to answer that Victor raised, um, similar to Deepa here, um, have to do with the question of internationalization. Um, uh, Victor asked, um, what struggles, challenges, and questions um, uh, should we be engaging with more? How might we try to grow UDC? How might we better um, engage diverse constituencies, especially communities of color? How do we confront racial capitalism in all its forms? So um, the question, <laughs> these are questions. Um, so the, the, question, the, the question that I found int intriguing here is what might UDC, how might UDC make interventions within the broader field to push things leftward? And picking up on some of the, the comments that Deepa made, um, I would argue that UDC um, should do much more um, to center colonial racial power in relation to its ongoing critique of capitalism. So there's, there, there, there needs to be much more thinking through that intersection and engaging with that intersection in terms of the politics um, of the work that we do um, as activist scholars, as activist students in our universities in our, and in our communities. Um, while the U.S. left and the U uh, UDC within this larger context has pushed against corporate greed and um, uh, created spaces for dissenting media, has pushed for regulatory interventions, corporate accountability, media studies as a field remains extraordinarily Eurocentric. And what, what is, I think, really important is that the normative theoretical core is stuck in critiques of um, uh, uh, of liberalism, um, and uh, I'm afraid to say often, too often, um, a, a 
colonial and race-blind Marxism. So there needs to be a way to engage with uh, critiques that bring together um, an anti-colonial uh, Marxism, an anti-colonial left politics um, that is not race blind. Um, and there are uh, traditions of this. Um, there are thinkers um, who, uh, you know, historically uh, communication scholars have not engaged with, right? Um, so we, we need to do more in, in terms of centering um, scholars from Du Bois and Fanon and Ambedkar in India uh, and, and many, many more, uh, Claudia Jones. Um, there are many scholars who are actually theorists of media and communications who are not part of our, um, art of our uh, curriculum, even within the more critical tradition. So we need to think about that and, and, and address it, and of course also engage with more contemporary scholars. Um, I want to just, um, I'm probably already running out of time. Am I running out of time? Two minutes, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I want to pick up on a couple of things that Deepa mentioned here um, in terms of this question of inter internationalization um, and thinking about questions of race more, um, race and internationalization more meaningfully in UDC. Um, I, want to, I want to pick up on the, the fact that, again, at this moment, this week, right now, we see um, in the US, um, and in much of the world, in, in Europe and elsewhere, um, a shrinking of, of spaces for dissent. Um, and it is very much, um, I just came from New York City, it feels like 9-11. You know, the, we are getting messages from our university um, that make you think like we are in a state of siege. And this is important for us to think about. It's, it's chilling in, in, in more ways than one. It's not just about um, students and, in, and academics being persecuted. At NYU, we have a law student um, who, um, who uh, posted a tweet um, you know, soon after the, um, the Hamas attacks, the, the brutal Hamas attacks, um, where she said that we have to understand the context of apartheid in Gaza. Um, she is now facing a possible expulsion from the university. Um, you know, we at NYU, uh, AAUP and other student groups and unions are fighting this just as people are fighting um, what's happening to the student groups um, who uh, signed the statement at Harvard and, and, you know, many other places. So there's those kinds of um, issues around academic dissent that we need to pay attention to. At UDC, it would be good to connect the kind of in cl uh, closing in of dissent, including academic dissent, with what's been happening in many parts of the world. One can think of India, Turkey, Iran, um, you know, many parts of the world where um, uh, academic speech has been curtailed, uh, <laughs> dissent is seen as sedition, um, and think about transnational solidarity um, across, um, across these different contexts. Um, the spaces of protests, which uh, many of us um, who were in graduate school and started our academic careers in the early 2000s, there were spaces of protest and dissent when we think of the anti-globalization movement, Seattle 1999, which came to a close after 9-11, right? Those spaces were closed after 9-11. And basically from the early 2000s until 2011, you had this uh, security discourse um, that made it very difficult to mobilize. Um, movements like Occupy, Black Lives Matter, the Indignados, the Arab uprisings opened up those spaces again, and of course culminating in the George Floyd uprising, and we see the closing again of those spaces. And so we have to be vigilant as um, academics and, of, and as students and as scholars um, of pushing back, of thinking consciously about how to push back, um, and of building bridges um, across issues and across borders. Um, I know I'm definitely out of time here. Um, I do want to close with one thing, which is um, I think this is true for in UDC and probably for a lot of um, left academic um, uh, scholarship um, in the US and elsewhere. Um, but I think a reclaiming of internationalism um, and a political future um, that pushes us left has to go hand in hand with the disavowal of the national idiom. And this is a very difficult thing to do. Here I'm quoting um, 
black studies scholar Fred Moten. Um, we have to attempt to think through the possibilities of mediated internationalism that disavows the national idiom. Um, because nationalism in the way that we think about uh, progressive futures um, is not what it was in the 1950s, right? And so in terms of anti-colonial nationalism. Nationalism in the context of the BRICS is Modi's authoritarianism, right? Yeah, is Erdogan's authoritarianism. So we have to learn how to be anti-imperialist and anti-authoritarian, right? And we have to figure out uh, ways to build those bridges in a shifting geopolitical order. So imperialism of 2023 is not the same as it was in the 1960s and 70s. We have to recognize that and think it through. So we have a lot of work ahead. <laughs> so I'll end here. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, many of us, um, it, it, it feels difficult to enter a day full of conversation um, and thinking and thinking, um, keeping in mind what's happening in Palestine today. So um, I'll just end with saying um, that it's a day also of great um, sorrow. So thank you. This is such an amazing panel. Thank you so much. I think there's so much to talk about and. Uh, you actually did answer most of my questions, so um, so I want to open it up. We have time for maybe one or two questions before we scatter to the next session. Does anyone have questions? Me? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I'm a new chapter in Israel, for those who don't know me. Um, I would like to say, uh, <clears throat> naturally from here, my politics are pretty clear. I would like to say also, I'm an activist for many years, and. I serve as chairman of the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. However, I was involved by what you have said, Deepa. I think that whatever one's ide ideological position on Zionism, on Israeli policy, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there can be no condoning understanding or acceptance of mass murder, of rape, of the killing of children on either side. And you have definitely justified the murder of children in this conference. I am very sorry to have been in the same room with you, in particular because I thought this was a family of people who are progressive and who believe in human rights and in humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Are we responding? Or? Yeah, you may respond. Okay. Yeah. I don't think you heard what I said. I heard um, every word you said. Okay. You started by saying that you're sorry, and then you said you understand it. There is nothing to understand about this. Okay? You cannot understand the killing of children, the abduction of civilians. Okay? A military operation is sorry. one thing, sorry. but you, the killing of children the... is not something that you can justify, and you have justified I'm, it. You should be ashamed I mean, would you like to no, I think I've already made the point that I want to make in my presentation, and how he chooses to interpret is entirely up to uh, him. Okay. We have time for another, an, I, one more question. Can, can I just say, yes. I'm an American Jew. I did not hear what you heard. In fact, I heard you start. To, to, to double down on that message and to say that, of course, these were horrible, brutal attacks, and that the left are hurting themselves if they promote them. So, I'm sorry, my, what I heard coming from these women was very, very different than how it was just heard. Sorry. Okay. Final, uh, final question. I was going to make this comment anyway, but I think this goes a long way towards resolving the conflict. One of the things we've had very much success with at Purdue, where I teach, is we've had uh, panels on anti-police demonstrations, we've had panels on the railroad strike, we've had panels on, uh, on the Mideast conflict. And in every case, when we've had a speaker that talked about media framing, 
it permits the people that are listening to the audience, uh, listening to the speakers, to, to develop their own critiques, to develop their own means. So if we explain media framing, what were the sources in that article? Who was quoted? What were the descriptors in that article? How did they frame the participants? What was the historical context? Was there any? And I think if we present those, it goes a long way towards resolving these kinds of debates because it allows everybody to say, aha, that's who your source was. Aha, that's how you describe the participants. Aha, there is absolutely no historic context. But I think if we do that, that's one of the things I would add to the tasks of the UBC going forward. Everybody on every campus can provide, either with our graduate students or ourselves, a media framing presentation on whatever the issue is, whether it's India or Turkey or Venezuela or Cuba or Palestine. We need to have teach-ins in every university. This is really, it's an incredible moment, and I think we really should be actively proposing that. Thank you. I think that's a great point to, to close on. These conversations will be continuing throughout the day. Much to cover. I want to thank the panelists again. Thank you so much. <laughs>